Thank you very much, Meta, and I'm really uh, honored today to have the opportunity uh, to introduce uh, Dr. Mark Z. Jacobson. Um, uh, given that uh, I'm on the board of the Ontario Sustainable Energy Association, which has been uh, pushing for 100% renewables for quite some time, I'm, uh, I'm thrilled to have uh, someone of this caliber uh, speak to us today on exactly that topic. Now, Dr. Jacobson is a professor of civil and environmental engineering, as well as energy resources engineering at Stanford. In 1988, he graduated with a Bachelor's of Science in Civil Engineering, with distinction, a BA in Economics, with distinction, and a Master's in Science in Environmental Engineering, all from Stanford University. I guess Stanford must limit uh, degrees to just three in one year. Procrastinate. <laughs> 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 yeah, I'm a little slacker. Um, he, then, he then moved to UCLA, where he received his master's and doctorate in atmospheric sciences. Professor Jacobson's analysis analyzes severe atmospheric problems that we face, such as air pollution and global warming. He then developed strategies for large-scale clean energy solutions to address these problems, an incredibly important item for today. His work provided the original scientific basis for European Parliament's resolution calling for black carbon emission controls. His paper, The Review of Energy Solutions to Global Warming, Air Pollution, and Energy Security, is the top all-time access paper in the Journal of Energy and Environmental Sciences. His appointments, publications, speaking engagements are too numerous to mention. So hard to distinguish awards, but I will mention three. Uh, the Harvard College Honorary National Scholarship, the highest award given by Harvard to incoming students. It's based on academic distinction and extracurricular achievements. And just to prove his extracurricular prowess, he had a tennis scholarship from Stanford. <laughs> and, and finally, he's an editor's, he won an editor's citation for excellence in referee. Now, if Mark were Canadian, of course, we would assume that this is from the hockey news editors. <laughs> but no, it was from the Journal of Geophysical Research Atmospheres. Please join me in welcoming Mark. Thank you for the very kind, generous introduction. Uh, and also thank all of you who I've met with today and I'll meet with later for, and, uh, for hosting me today, for, uh, bringing me here. This is really nice. It's a nice event I mean, today, but also uh, seeing how uh, the energy in Ontario is so progressive. I'm really impressed. Yeah, but there's still, in, in terms of, well, <laughs> well, progressive compared to a few years ago, but it's a long, long way to go. And so this is what I want to talk about. How do you get to the rest of the 100% renewable energy? Uh, so what I want to talk about is really a plan that uh, we've contemplated over, over a decade, but really came into fruition within the last few years on how to change the energy infrastructure, not only of the world, but also uh, individual regions and large provinces even. And so what, let me start by motivating this. Well, why do we care? Why do we want to act quickly? And everybody has their own perspective of why this matters. But from my point of view, it's from an air pollution and climate point of view. Uh, air pollution kills two and a half to three million people per year worldwide. Uh, in the U.S., it's on the order of 50 to 100,000 per year. In Europe, it's on the order of 300,000 or more per year. And in Canada, it's still on the order of tens of thousands. I don't know the precise number. But it's worldwide. I mean, when we look outside today, you know, it doesn't necessarily look uh, polluted, but most of the world, as I'll show you, uh, looks a lot different. Uh, Arctic sea ice is melting rapidly, and last month, in fact, it was the uh, lowest sea ice record in satellite history, and uh, higher, uh, higher population, increasing energy demand worldwide is going to uh, enhance both the air pollution and the climate problems over time. 
And uh, if we want to maintain stability, political stability, economic stability, and social stability, we need to maintain a pretty constant pricing for energy. But this is not possible with fossil fuels, uh, because, and even in uranium, which is depletable, because of the gradual increase in the high cost of mining and transporting and the actual uh, generation of fuels and their eventual shortages. And so these are serious problems in terms of maintaining uh, constant pricing and, and energy stability and also air pollution and global warming. These are serious problems that require serious solutions. And so just to give some examples, um, is, there, is it possible to darken the front? Of this little bit? I don't know if you can tell well. There's a, there's a switch right there. I don't know what happens if you push it. But. Right, fine. Uh, you can see this. Is fine. So I want, yeah. just giving some examples of cities around the world where air pollution is uh, is very severe. Most mega cities of the world uh, really look like this and don't look like what we see now in North America and Europe for the most part. And especially in places like China and India uh, where there's a lot of indoor burning of uh, solid biofuels for heating and cooking, uh, there's a high mortality rate in fact, the infant, mort well, infant mortality rate and the mortality rate of, of children under five years old is incredibly high. It's, it's like 20% of all the mortalities associated with air pollution. So these are issues that we're trying to address through clean and renewable energy. Uh, Lin Fen, China here, for example, living here is like smoking three packs of cigarettes every day. And, but in case you think that it's not really possible elsewhere, I mean, these are the lungs of a, a teenager from, who lived in Los Angeles in the 1970s who died in a car crash and was a non-smoker. And this is what's equivalent to smoking two packs of cigarettes a day. And so this is what the lungs of uh, most people in the world, especially in developing countries, uh, look like. I mean, if you, if you live in a big city in, in uh, you, the United States, in fact, the average life of a person in the U.S. is reduced by six to nine months due to air pollution. And it's probably a similar number for Canada. So these are problems that most of us don't realize, but they are very costly. It costs on the order of three to four percent of the gross domestic product of a given country for air pollution health costs. Now in terms of, and I'll explain that a little bit more. Uh, just another example of, well, of climate change or global warming. Uh, these are the temp this is the temperature record from the 1880 from 1882 to the present. And it's the rate of change of temperature increase that's so serious. I mean, we do have the highest uh, temperatures in the last in the 2000s. We have nine out of the 10 warmest years on record since the mid-1800s. However, in history, we have had a higher temperatures than today. 100 million years ago, there was no ice on the Earth and the temperatures were warmer. But nobody lived back then. Right now we have higher temperatures and, rapid, and rapidly increasing temperatures in the presence of over 7 billion people. If we flood all the, well, if we melt all the ice, that would be about 65 to 70 meters of sea level rise. And that would uh, flood 7% of all the land in the world. Most of it's on the coastline where most people live. And with regard to melting, this just shows the uh, sea ice in 2012, which is the blue line on the bottom. Uh, you can see in September, it was the minimum sea ice, and that's the lowest on record uh, compared with the average, which is the black line, and the, the previous minimum was in 2007, which is the green dotted line. So sea ice melting is significant because it uncovers the low albedo ocean below, and so once you remove all the sea ice, you may get a tipping point where it's difficult to recover from, a positive feedback because you have a dark ocean instead of light sea ice to reflect the light so you can get more rapid warming, uh, especially during uh, winter months if it's also gone in the winter. In any case, so I'm not here to talk about problems, I'm here to talk about solutions. So let's look at 
how we could solve these problems from a technical point of view, first of all. So the first slide here is based on a review we did on looking at different energy, potential energy solutions to global warming, air pollution, and energy security. We came up with a ranking based on looking at the externality or, or combined all the other impacts that are not embodied in price of different types of energy technologies for transportation and also for electric power. And then a lot of these are, we'd also apply these to heating and cooling and industrial processes, but I'm just showing electricity and transportation here. Now, the ones that are recommended versus not recommended, well, first of all, I don't have everything on here. I don't have like plain coal or um, you know, a lot of different types of fuels. But what's not recommended, it's not necessarily some of these things in the not recommended list are uh, technologies that are, might be better than what we have today, but they're just not so good as the ones that are recommended in terms of all the externalities. So what externalities or, or impacts are we looking at? Well, we're looking at global warming relevant emissions, air pollution, health impacts, uh, impacts on water supplies, impacts on land use, so on land, the footprint and the spacing of land. Uh, we're also looking at reliability that's that uh, comes into play in terms of matching electric load, looking at catastrophic risk, and uh, a variety of other uh, external factors that won't be embodied necessarily in the price. But what came out on top were wind, geo well, wind concentrated solar, the CSP, geothermal, tidal, photovoltaics, wave power, and hydroelectricity for electric power options. But not recommended for electric power were nuclear, coal with carbon capture, or natural gas or biomass for electricity. Again, not because some of these might not might be better than what we have now on average, but uh, because they're not so good as the first ones. But I will discuss each of these that are not recommended in a little more detail in a minute. In terms of vehicles, uh, wind, when we call these ones that are recommended, wind, water, and sun. Uh, and wind, water, and sun powering battery electric vehicles are highly recommended for transportation, and also some, to some extent hydrogen fuel cell vehicles, although it's not quite so efficient or ne not nearly as efficient as battery electrics, but they're more efficient than internal combustion. But for, we don't recommend liquid fuels such as corn or cellulosic or sugarcane ethanol or soya or algae biodiesel or compressed natural gas. So let me try to go over a little bit why not some of these other things. Well, in terms of nat for natural gas, it's about 50 to 70 times more carbon dioxide equivalent emissions than wind energy per unit electric power generated. And this is without uh, even conventional natural gas, not hydrofract gas. Methane from natural gas is a, well, so from natural gas, the two main contributors to warming are the CO2 and the methane. And the methane has a shorter lifetime and a stronger impact over a shorter period than, uh, carbon, than if you than if you looked at a 100-year lifetime, which most people do look at. But we're really interested in the 20-year lifetime because this is the relevant lifetime for the Arctic sea ice and other uh, tipping points in the climate system. And so in particular, because methane has such a short lifetime and a strong impact over the short lifetime, uh, it's actually one of the main contributors, along with black carbon, uh, to Arctic sea ice loss. Or conversely, if you wanted to slow the Arctic sea ice loss, the best ways to do it are to control black carbon and methane. And methane, one of the main sources, is natural gas. So this is a, it's a common misconception that natural gas actually causes less global warming from coal, ironically. Coal causes more air pollution health impacts than natural gas uh, because of this high sulfur emissions uh, relative to natural gas and the sulfate aerosol. And aerosol and other particulate matter are leading causes sorry, the, sul the sulfate aerosol plus the other particular matter from coal are leading causes of air pollution mortality. But that same sulfur from coal ironically offsets some of the wing from natural gas, from coal compared to natural gas. And so, if you, especially if you look at the 20 year lifetime, the 20 year time frame, there's more warming from natural gas than coal per unit energy, but, they're, but the coal caused more health problems. So they're both bad. They're, they're, neither of them are a solution to this, these problems that we face. And don't be fooled by the natural gas industry who wants to say that, oh, this is a clean bridge fuel. This is not a bridge fuel. It's really a bridge to nowhere fuel. 
because of the problems associated with it, it still causes significant warming and it still causes air pollution health problems through the oxides of nitrogen which convert about half of all the NOx emissions from natural gas, which there's a significant amount, convert to what's called nitrate aerosol particles that affect human health directly. So there's, there's really no benefit of either of them in terms of, of this combined problem that we're looking at. And high, most of the, in the last few years, there's been an increase of what's called uh, hydrofracking, or the injection of underground of a water mixed with chemicals to try to loosen up the shale rock to try to extract methane more easily. And this is thought to increase the methane slightly or more, and there's a lot of uncertainty uh, compared with conventional natural gas. Uh, but it doesn't really matter if you're using hydrofract or conventional, they're still, they still have the same problem. But the hydrofract gas is uh, probably causing a little more problem. Now, what, what's called clean coal, or coal with carbon capture. This is where you try to sequester the carbon from the exhaust stream underground. And through, and you can actually reduce about 85 to 90 percent of the CO2 emissions from uh, the stack through coal with carbon capture. However, you need 25 percent more coal to do this. That's how much additional energy is required to run the carbon capture equipment. And so you actually need 25 percent more coal mining and transport and use. And you don't actually reduce any of the other. Uh, pollutants from coal, such as sulfur oxides or nitrogen oxides, so you actually have 25% more of all the other pollutants. And you don't reduce any of the CO2 from the mining or transport. So as a result, you still have about 50 times more carbon equivalent emissions than wind energy, and about 150 times more air pollution than wind energy when you use coal with your carbon capture. And there is no real, there's no real, uh, there's some examples of carbon capture but there no real, it's not really commercially viable even at this time. So this is not an option if we're trying to solve uh, the pro our problems. Uh, why not nuclear? Well, okay, so nuclear is one of those that, okay, it's better than a lot of the other things that we're looking at, but it's not so good as wind or solar as we'll see. Uh, for example, it's about 9 to 25 times more carbon equivalent emissions than wind energy with half of that due to the fact that you need to mine and refine uranium continuously. In the United States, there are two coal-fired power plants whose sole purpose is to refine uranium for nuclear power and nuclear weapons use. And in addition, uh, in addition to the construction of the plants, but the, the ref mining and refining uranium is something you have to do continuously. But it also takes between 10 and 19 years to put up a nuclear plant. And it com compared with, on average, uh, two to five years for wind or solar farms. And as a result, there's what's called an opportunity cost loss of emissions, which is during the, meet, during the uh, years between when you could have put up the, the wind and solar farm, the additional, uh, at a minimum, five years, but up to, up to 14 years, you're running the regular electric power grid, which is dominated uh, in a lot of places by coal. So for the US, it's a, it's 60% coal, it's actually down to 50% now, but uh, it's a significant coal, but also natural gas. So you're putting out a lot of carbon. So that's where the rest of that uh, carbon equivalent emissions comes from. Well, then there's the risk of meltdown as we've seen. 1.5% of all nuclear power plants ever built have melted down to some degree, reactors that is, including in, most recently in Fukushima, there are several of them that melted down. And then there's the risk of nuclear weapons proliferation. There are five countries who that have developed nuclear weapons uh, capability or tried to develop nu nuclear weapons capability secretly under the guise of civilian nuclear weapons research. And it's not to say that you can, couldn't do it otherwise, it's just that it gives, it gives a country more cover to develop weapons. And so if, if you wanted to repower the entire world with nuclear, you'd need about 16,850 megawatt, 16,850 megawatt reactors. And we have about, uh, 440 today, minus about 50 that were shut down in Japan, so it's about 390. So even if you powered 5% of the world for all purposes with nuclear, that would mean uh, more than doubling the number of nuclear power plants worldwide. So many more countries of the world would want to have nuclear uh, reactors for civilian purposes, and some of these uh, would ultimately develop weapons. So there's a risk of proliferation that could result in uh, more serious catastrophic risk. 
associated with, with warfare or terrorism. Whereas there is zero risk associated with uh, wind and solar for the and some of these other uh, clean technologies. So it's really a question of, of of lower risk as well. Even though there's no no certainty that that will result in a damage, there is just some risk of it. And then there are also unresolved waste issues. And finally, why not uh, eth uh, ethanol? I can say biofuels in general, but I'll just use ethanol as an example. Well. Corn and cellulosic ethanol, they're combust you have to combust them in vehicles. And it doesn't actually matter what the source of ethanol is, it's still used in a vehicle and you burn it. And so a study that we did looking at the effects on the US air pollution health of converting all the vehicles, we found that in most of the United States and the cities uh, that are dominated by vehicle exhaust, such as Los Angeles and on the East Coast, that you will slightly increase the air pollution mortality uh, by converting to ethanol. There's some places you get a decrease, like in the southwest U.S., uh, due to the fact that uh, you already have a lot of organic gases from vegetation, and that the ethanol organics, such as acetaldehyde, uh, don't make much so much of a difference. And so you, get the, you don't get so much of it, but it's still similar to what you get from gasoline. As opposed to if you convert everything to uh, electric vehicles powered by wind for, or solar, for example, you reduce essentially 99 percent plus of all air pollution. And considering that you know, vehicles cause about 20 to 25 percent of or it's 20 to 25,000 air pollution deaths in the US per year, uh, that's a significant cost to just in the health effects alone. But in terms of climate effects, uh, corn ethanol, it's pretty known that it, it's similar to gasoline in terms of its overall carbon emissions. Cellulosic ethanol, uh, it could be better than gasoline, maybe 50%, but it could be 50% worse if you account for land use changes, depending on what those, uh, because of due to price changes of the, because you're using uh, uh, land for, uh, for fuel instead of food, so that results in uh, land use changes, which result in price changes around the world. So there's uncertainty, so it could be 50 to 150% of these CO2 emissions compared to gasoline. But that's not good enough because we're looking at trying to get 99% reductions, not 50% reductions or 0% reductions. There are also land use and water requirements, as I'll show you shortly. So really briefly, in terms of what are the technologies that we are uh, looking at, uh, of course, wind, or you take the kinetic energy out of the wind and you convert it into electrical energy through a turbine. And uh, wave power, you take the up and down motion of uh, water waves and then there's a transmission cable under shore under water that's connected to shore uh, hydroelectric power we take the energy from the falling water gravitational energy converted to electric power uh, tidal turbines uh, these are just wind turbines under the water but they take advantage of the regular motions of the tide so they're a little more reliable than wind turbines in terms of providing stable energy and then geothermal, which are the bottom two slides, uh, the bottom right just shows steam coming up from under the ground, and the left is a geothermal power plant, which you basically take advantage of hot rocks under the ground and pass water over the rocks and through one hole, and it comes up the other hole to generate steam to run a turbine. Uh, then there's concentrated solar power, where you focus light onto a, a central tower receiver using a bunch of mirrors. In a central tower receiver, you have a molten nitrate salt that you heat up, and that can be stored at night uh, to generate electricity at night. And then there's a photovoltaic power plants on the right here, which just large arrays of PV on the ground, or could be on canopies, uh, and on rooftop solar. Rooftop solar is in the middle there. Uh, for transportation, electric cars and hydrogen fuel cell vehicles, uh, we have the Tesla Roadster on the top left. It goes 240 miles, charges with a 220 volt charger, a three and a half hour charge. The Nissan Leaf, it's a, it's charges at, uh, it goes 80 miles, so it's not quite so far, but it's more for local commuting. Uh, the Tesla Model S, this goes 310 miles. It can be charged with a 440 volt charger in one hour. And so it's this is a car that's currently now available uh, and operational, and, and so is being produced quite a bit. Tesla is actually ramping up. They're going to be producing a, next an SUV and then a commodity car. They have a plant that they'll produce up to a million cars per year, electric vehicles. 
down at the bottom, hydrogen fuel cell bus. Then we have an electric truck and hydrogen fuel cell electric hybrid bus. These are all existing technologies that would be run basically from electricity. In terms of uh, well, boats, we have there's a hydrogen fuel cell boat, an existing one. Uh, this is a largely electric ship on the bottom. Uh, and then we have a, a, a a hydrogen fuel cell tractor on the top, and then this is a cryogenic drawing for a cryogenic hydrogen aircraft. So an aircraft would be, be the hardest thing to uh, transform, and one way would be through liquefying hydrogen and compressing it. Now, these, this aircraft would require larger volume, but it weighs less than conventional jet fuel, and so it has about the same overall drag, but hydrogen has been used in the space shuttle and the Russians built a hydrogen aircraft in the late 1980s that ran, they ran it on some test flights. So this is, these are existing technologies, although they have, some of these haven't been used very much. Uh, what about heating and cooling? For uh, heating and cooling, we use air source and ground source heat pumps, uh, such as on the left, these run on electricity. In the middle, it's a heat pump water heater, so it's, you take the heat out of the air or out of the ground, or you could have a water source heat pump, you take it out of your swimming pool and use that as the source of uh, heat for heating hot water, for heating water or air. Or the air source heat pump can be run in reverse and used for air conditioning. Uh, for the water heater, you can also have solar hot water preheaters on your roof, these are pretty inexpensive. And, okay, so let's, so these are all, we're looking all at technologies that exist today. Can we power the entire world for all purposes with these technologies? So let's look at the world power demand, the end use, which is what people actually use uh, to run all their devices and to get where they want to go, etc. And so the end use power demand in 2010 was 12 and a half terawatts. Uh, in 2030, with uh, Conventional fuels, we expect it to go up to 16.9 or 17 terawatts. Turns out by converting to electricity and electrolytic hydrogen with just some minor conservation, and we're assuming just minor conservation, sorry, uh, then we go down 32% to 11 and a half terawatts. That's because electricity is so much more efficient than internal combustion uh, for several applications, such as for uh, vehicles. The average internal combustion uh, efficiency from tank to wheels about 17 to 20 percent and rest of it the remaining 80 percent goes to waste heat for electric vehicles the average plug to wheel efficiency is 80 to 86 percent so only 14 to 20 percent goes to waste heat that means that you need less energy to drive a car the same distance as you need to with if it's electric than you need for an internal combustion car that also means that the cost of electricity to run your car is equivalent to right now about 80 cents to a dollar a gallon equivalent versus four to 450 a gallon for gasoline. So it's one fourth to one fifth the cost for the fuel to run your car. So although the electric car right now is more expensive, uh, you save, if you're driving 15,000 miles per year, you're saving about $1,500 uh, per year in, in fuel costs. And so you can pay off that difference in the car costs over maybe three to four years generally. And you know, if you already have the subsidy, then you're actually just getting a profit from it. So in the US, they already offer a $7,000 tax credit for electric cars. So their prices are pretty comparable. And so then you're getting a net benefit by saving on your fuel costs. But you also have the convenience factor. You can charge it in your own home and instead of having to go to your fueling station. And there are fewer moving parts, so you have fewer things breaking down. I'll tell you, it's a, there's, there's really little disadvantage of electric cars, uh, especially since the distance barriers are being uh, driven down. Now, if we look in the US, and I think some of these numbers, are, in terms of percent differences, are similar to Canada, we reduce the power demand 37% by going to this clean energy system. Without, so this is really without changing our habits we get a reduction. And we also did a case for New York State because we're looking at that in some detail and we get a 37% uh, reduction as well for New York State, uh, their power demand by converting. Now, if we want to power the world with all these devices, how many do we need? So this is one scenario. It's not by any means the only scenario possible. <coughs> 
And so in this scenario, we have 50% wind, 40% solar, and 10% everything else. And the wind is divided between onshore and offshore wind. Uh, but they, we have about 3.8 million 5 megawatt wind turbines to power half the world for all purposes. So, I mean, 4 million turbines, that sounds like a lot. But, you know, in, right now the world produces every year 70 million cars. Uh, in World War II, the world produced 800,000 aircraft in five years. And so to produce 4 million uh, wind turbines, basically once every 30 years, or even after 30 years, you can refurbish a lot of these turbines, is really is not technologically a big deal. Now, what about the rest of these devices? Well, let's look at the solar first. So we have 20% concentrated solar plants, 14% solar PV plants, and 6% rooftop. But that 6% rooftop represents 1.7 billion 3 kilowatt systems on rooftops. Now, a lot of those could be combined into uh, groups of, like a, an a industrial complex or a commercial building could have tens or hundreds of systems. So it doesn't mean you need, these are separate systems, you can combine them together. Uh, and if we can do more than 6% rooftop on a global scale, that would be great. But this was, this is a lot of rooftops already. Uh, but we can probably do better. Now, in terms of hydroelectric, we assume we'd have 4% hydro, but 70% of that's already in place. And we probably wouldn't grow hydro that much because there's a lot of resistance to it. I mean, it does have some disadvantages, even though it's, it is, turns out to be very clean in terms of the emissions associated with air pollutants and global warming relevant emissions. Uh, with geothermal, it's about 4%, so that would grow a little bit, and 1% wave and tidal power. So what about the resources? This is a map for modeling of the world wind speeds at 100 meters. And this uh, indicates that, well, the total wind uh, power available at high wind locations if we just look at the wind speed, it's between 70 and 80 terawatts. So that's six to seven times more uh, power in the wind in high wind locations over land, that is, than we need to power the entire world's energy infrastructure for all purposes many times over. You can see in the Great Plains and offshore of the East Coast, uh, there's a significant amount of wind. And I can look. And, okay, so. This though shows, well, there's a big question that arises. If we, if we put a lot of wind turbines up, how much does this uh, reduce the energy in the atmosphere? What are the climate effects of this? And so this actually addresses this. We did this study that came out actually just a few weeks ago that looked at the world, what's called the world saturation wind power potential. If we start adding turbines all over the world, and we looked at it separately over land and the jet streams, What's the maximum amount of power you can extract from the wind before you just you can't just extract any more? And by following the blue curve, that tells you the world, what's called the saturation wind potential. So it indicates that the maximum you can take out of the, the air at 100 meters height over both land and ocean worldwide is about uh, 260 terawatts. Or you know, it's on the order of 260 terawatts, which again, the power demand for all purposes we need to satisfy is on the order of 12 terawatts. And if we do 50% wind, we need about six terawatts. So we only need six terawatts out of 260 or so terawatts. Now over land, the maximum potential, because we reach a saturation point because of the interference of one turbine with, you're extracting energy with one turbine, so there's not enough available for other turbines. So the saturation point for over land is on the order of 80 terawatts, land and near shore. So there's still plenty of wind on land and near shore uh, to, we only need six terawatts and there's about 80. So it turns out the climate effects of all this is because you're reducing the wind speeds uh, near the turbines, you reduce evaporation rates because uh, evaporation rates over soil and also over land are proportional to the wind speed. Also, it's proportional to turbulence, but it turns out the wind speed is more important. And as a result, you reduce water vapor in the air, and water vapor is a greenhouse gas, and the net effect of that is to cool. So by increasing wind penetrations, you actually reduce 
global temperature slightly, although it's not a very significant amount because we're not, we're not going to be doing the whole thing anyway. But so there's really three things you're doing by, four things you're doing by replacing coal, for example, or gas with wind. You are, the coal and the gas and the and natural gas are both emitting uh, water vapor as a combustion product because they burning burning um, either methane or coal. One of the products is the CO2 plus water. So you're reducing water vapor. You're reducing direct heat emissions to the air because they both result in waste heat that goes right to the air. They're reducing carbon and it's reducing carbon dioxide. So the three components of gas and coal that you're reducing are CO2, water vapor, and uh, direct heat. And simultaneously, and so all those affect global temperatures, some more regional than global. But by adding the turbines, you're also reducing the water vapor too. And so that's a fourth thing that you're benefiting. So there's really only a, a net benefit, and plus you're reducing all the pollutants. And so you have le less health effects and less climate effects by adding wind turbines uh, on a global or regional scale to the atmosphere. Now, we looked at resources. Uh, this is for the for New York because we were looking at New York State and in a little more detail. And you can see offshore the red. Well, these are in capacity factors. And so anything with a capacity factor above 30% is pretty cost competitive on land. Offshore, you probably need 35 to 40%. But you can see offshore, there's a huge resource there. I mean, this can power, in fact, uh, the entire East Coast, uh, the population of the East Coast with offshore wind alone, uh, pretty readily. And, but then on land, anything that's dark green or even light green is okay, and, and red, uh, you can see there's a lot of wind resource in New York on shore. So we combine this with uh, solar resources, which uh, here is the solar map of the world. And solar, there's even more solar than wind in high solar locations. There are about 340 terawatts of solar available in high solar locations compared with about 11 and a half terawatts that we need to power the entire world. So there's about 30 times more solar than we need. And you can go down uh, to, I mean, the, the high solar locations are mostly in places in red, but you can go down to some of the light blue and still get reasonable uh, solar. It just becomes more expensive as you get less power from it. Now, let's look at, start looking at how much land or space this all takes up. So let's do an example with on-road vehicles in the US. So if we look at different technologies powering on-road vehicles, how much area does this require? For so cellulosic ethanol, which is second generation ethanol that actually there is no commercial refinery for cellulosic ethanol anywhere in the world today, even though it's been tested for since 1981. Uh, the estimates for the land areas that would be required for this range from 5% to 35% of the entire US, including Alaska. 5% is from the ethanol industry and 35% is from scientific study. <laughs> so this is this is just represents the average between the two. But corn ethanol, there's a little less uncertainty, although it's still a big range, it's between 10% and 18%, so 14% on average. But these are taking up quite a bit of land uh, that would be dedicated just for fuel production, just to run your vehicles, and that would still result in all the air pollution that we currently have. Now, nuclear, this is not one of the issues in terms of uh, land. It takes up about the size of Rhode Island, so unless you live in Rhode Island, and the <laughs> sacrifice Rhode Island for all the nuclear. Um, for wind, there's a red dot. There's the, the black area is the spacing between all the turbines. So it's, it represents about half a percent of the US. And the red dot is one to three square kilometers. That's, you require on the ground one to three square kilometers of land to power the entire US vehicle fleet. But you need the spacing in between the turbines that can be used as either farmland, ranch land, range land, open space, or it could be uh, over the water too offshore, so it doesn't require any land. Now for uh, solar and geothermal, they take up less spacing than winds to do the same thing, but more footprint in both cases. Geothermal is pretty small footprint as well, but still larger than wind, but less, uh, less spacing. So the, if you look at solar, geothermal, and wind, they really don't take up 
a huge amount of space in comparison, uh, certainly with ethanol fuels. So this is an issue that uh, uh, of land use issue that's pretty important. In terms of New York, let's look at uh, if we wanted to repower the entire state of New York for all purposes, not just electric power, but also heating and cooling, transportation, and industrial processes, this is the areas that would be required. These are the areas. So we have a lot of offshore wind, and so the blue is the spacing, and the red is kind of a footprint. And there's some onshore wind, and then there's solar PV and CSP power plants. There's geothermal, which is a little dot that you can't see. And then there's rooftop PV. Uh, and the total additional space on land you need is about 0.9% of New York State beyond rooftop. This would be rooftop, so we don't count that as new land. But 0.9% for the CSP and photovoltaic power plants. And about 1.5% for spacing between turbines, so which is you can use for multiple purposes. So it's on the order, really, of less than 1% of, of real land taken up, but then 2% if you count the spacing. But that's to exchange, to get us to get rid of all the oil refineries, all the nuclear plants, all the biomass factories and refineries, all the all the pipelines you can exchange for some tra transmission lines, and and, and then set, and reducing the health cost by effectively uh, 32 billion dollars a year, and then reducing all the global warming impacts of the state. Now, what about reliability? Can you match the power demand with the supply? So we've looked at this in, in a lot of detail in California. We find that by combining uh, wind and solar and geothermal and using hydroelectric to fill in gaps, and without increasing the hydroelectric or increasing the geothermal that much, for that matter, uh, we can match power demand pretty well uh, most hours over a two-year period. So this shows two particular days to illustrate. And the orange on the bottom is base load geothermal. Uh, the light blue is wind, which mostly peaks at night over land <coughs> in California. Uh, the yellow is solar PV. The orange is concentrated solar, which there's a little bit of storage for nighttime use. And the dark blue is, is hydroelectric, and the black line is the load. The gray on top is backup natural gas, which is not used on either of these days. And we found that over a two-year period that we can match the power demand exactly for 99.8% of the hours. So we only needed natural gas 0.2% of the hours to meet a loss of load of one day in 10 years, which is the industry standard. And we find that you can, and this is without any storage aside from hydro and concentrated solar, or without and without demand response, and without oversizing the grid or using vehicles uh, to store in battery vehicles for storing uh, electricity. This is just by optimizing the system. And to get the rest of the system optimal, we would use, uh, we would use all these other methods. So for example, there's several other methods of <coughs> matching the load. And one is by interconnecting geographically dispersed uh, wind or solar resources. So that, would, that helps because if the wind's not blowing in California, well, there's a greater chance it's blowing in Wyoming, which is you know just a transmission line away, and there are existing transmission lines because their coal comes right from Wyoming to California currently. So replacing that coal with wind because there's a good wind resource there would be one thing. Uh, but well, the bundling, which is this thing I showed you the graph of, these wind, water, and sun resources together to match the load, uh, and using hydro to fill the gaps. That was the second thing. So that's what I showed using demand response management where you would you give incentives to, let's say, a wastewater treatment plant to not, uh, per, not use electricity during peak times of day and shift their load to nighttime because it doesn't really matter so much when they use their electricity. Uh, oversizing the peak generation because we're interested in powering not only the electric power sector but also transportation, heating and cooling in the industry. So if we put in more wind and solar than we need, for the electric power sector, it makes it easier to match the demand in the power sector. But then when we have too much wind and solar, we can dump it into either hydrogen for some of the other sectors, producing hydrogen, or for heating, for district heating, which is a, something being proposed here. Uh, 
or it could be uh, dumped into some other storage medium if that's necessary. Uh, then also storing electric power on site through battery electric vehicles or through battery storage, uh, and through battery electric vehicles, that's, there's a vehicle to grid, which, you, which may not be the most efficient thing to do, it may degrade batteries, but there might be a market for that where you store electricity in, in people's cars, who have battery cars, and then they have some agreement with the utility that uh, they can, the utility can draw electricity backwards uh, from them when they need it. And then also, to, by forecasting the winds better and solar better, then you can reduce your reserve requirements. And that's another way to make things more efficient, to reduce the costs of, of these uh, energy systems. And in terms of cost, so let's look uh, first at the current cost of conventional fuels versus these different generators. Uh, conventional fuels right now, their, their cost is about seven cents a kilowatt hour, not the price that you pay. The average price of electricity, residential electricity in the US is about 13 cents a kilowatt hour. But the, the cost of conventional fuel, the business cost is about seven cents a kilowatt hour. And there's another five cents or more due to health and, and climate costs and mostly uh, health costs right now. So it's really 12.3 cents a kilowatt hour is, is the cost. Uh, in 2030, expected to go up to 14 to 15 cents a kilowatt hour, uh, just based on, these are very conservative numbers based on uh, informa Energy Information Administration statistics. But if we look at onshore wind, it's four to seven cents a kilowatt hour. And offshore winds is more expensive, 10 to 17. Uh, solar is the costs have come down around nine to thirteen cents a kilowatt hour, so nine to 11, yeah, thirteen for utility scale solar, which is equivalent to about between two dollars and thirty cents and, and two dollars and ninety cents a watt. That's the latest price of solar for the utility scale. So these these costs are pretty competitive. Uh, hydro is already pretty inexpensive and geothermal, but wave and tidal are more expensive. If we go to two thousand thirty, all of these. Uh, wind, water, and solar technologies become cost competitive, particularly when you look at the externality costs of the fossil fuels. So just to demonstrate the costs of, uh, of clean electric power, this is not proof, but it's kind of a, just an illustration. If we look at the five states in the US that have the highest percent of electric power from wind in 2011, which are South Dakota, Iowa, North Dakota, uh, Minnesota and Wyoming. Their average electricity price went up two cents a kilowatt hour between 2003 and 2011. The remaining 45 states, uh, their price went up by 3.6 cents a kilowatt hour. So there, clearly the problem is that the fuel price of conventional fuels, it gradually increases due to higher labor costs, higher mining costs uh, and extraction. In fact, you can see this most clearly by Hawaii's price of electricity. It went up from 16 to 33 cents a kilowatt hour in the same period. And so, that, because they have to transport all their fuel to the island. And so, if they were actually producing their fuel on site, there's no way they'd be paying 33 cents a kilowatt hour by producing all their fuel indigenously for, through wind and solar, since they do have such good resources there. So, that's one lesson from this is that the fuel price. Of, con of conventional fuels will vary and is gradually increasing, whereas that of wind, water, and sun is stable. This leads to price stability. So let's look a little more, more detail in New York State because as an example of the health cost from eliminating the conventional fuels. There are about 4,000 deaths per year and many tens of thousands more mortal uh, morbidities in New York State. And this costs the state about $33 billion per year. And that's on the order of 3% of the gross domestic product of the state. So this is a cost that you know, people don't look at when they're looking at electricity prices usually. And so to convert the entire state for all purposes to wind, water, and sun, you need about 270 gigawatts. And that would cost, that's just for the generators, of electric, but that's for all purposes, transportation, heating, cooling, electricity, et cetera. And that would cost on the order of $570 billion of capital. And if you just look theoretically, the health cost savings alone, without even 
charging for the electricity would pay this off in 17 years. And if you charge for the electricity, it goes down to about 11 years. So this would seem like a, an obvious thing to consider when looking at um, conversion. It also would generate about 71,000 permanent jobs in the state. And since the state imports most of its fuel right now, coal, oil, and gas are almost all imported. And there are about 35,000 jobs in the uh, energy sector right now. There's a net increase of jobs estimated uh, due to this. And then plus, the, actually, on the order of millions of construction jobs that are more temporary to actually put up the infrastructure. And as I mentioned, the fuel price will be free, so the prices will fluctuate. Now, let's just look briefly at materials. Uh, in order to produce you know, lots of wind turbines, lots of solar panels and batteries, you need certain materials, so rare earth elements. Uh, neodymium is one that's used in permanent magnets and wind turbine generators. Uh, now, if you want to produce four million wind turbines, to power half the world for all purposes, you need about 4.4 uh, teragrams of neodymium. But the world resources that we know of today are on the order of 27, so we don't think that that's a, a barrier to the large scale production of wind turbines. In terms of batteries, uh, we would need, well, we currently have 800 million vehicles in the world, and if we converted all these to battery electrics, for example, uh, we would. It turns out we have enough, we have plenty of resource. We have 20, uh, 33 teragrams of lithium available on land from known resources. And that's enough to produce 3.3 billion vehicles. So if everybody gets five, four or five cars, then, uh, then we might run out. Okay, but sure, there's gonna be an increase of demand for vehicles, but we don't think at this point that's a limit, although at some point recycling may be needed. needed. And there are also other resources available but there are other lithium resources available. This is the um, Bolivian salt flats where it's just a, under here about just a, a meter or so below the surface is the largest uh, lithium resource in the world. It's just an open salt flat. Is that cloud cover or what's the word? Sorry. It's no, that's salt. That's salt. salt. That's salt. Oh. Yeah, that's the ground. That's, so these are tire tracks basically. A road. It's a road over the salt pots right now. But this just goes on for miles and miles in both directions. Okay, so then, so let me summarize. Well, so we think that there's, it's technically feasible to power the entire world for all purposes with wind, water, and sun, and electricity, producing electricity and some electrolytic hydrogen for all purposes. And this would reduce world power demand significantly just by going to electricity. And you'd eliminate two and a half to three million deaths per year worldwide. And eliminate global warming, provide energy stability, generate more permanent jobs than it destroys, we think, even, I just showed you for New York, but the estimates for the generation of uh, jobs from renewable energies uh, from the studies I've seen show that there is gen more generation than loss of jobs. But you'd reduce the, you'd stabilize fuel prices over time. Uh, in terms of land, you'd need about 1% of the world's land to do this. About, and have more than half of that's for spacing, and the other half is for actual footprint. There are many methods of addressing variability, and materials are not limits, but recycling may be needed. But there are barriers and upfront costs, uh, which include upfront costs, transmission needs, and lobbying and politics. And in terms of transmission, and for long distance transmission, the cost is on the order of somewhere between 0.3 cents and 3 cents a kilowatt hour, with a median of 1 cent a kilowatt hour for 1,200 kilometer to 2,000 kilometer lines. And so we don't think that that's a barrier so much because considering that the price of electricity is around 13 cents a kilowatt hour, 